Well, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce to all of you Juliana Chan, CEO, Wild Type Media, and the panelists for this session, Skills and Education in the Race for Humanity. Please welcome Juliana Chan. Welcome, take a seat. I'm looking for Lily in the screen. Is she gonna appear? Ah, there she is. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the conference. So how do we get more women a seat at the table? My name is Juliana Chan, and I'm the CEO of Wild Type Media Group. This is a company I founded to promote science communication across Asia. And I will be a moderator for today. As a mother of two young children, of which one is a girl and a former university professor, I think it is safe to say that education is the great universal leveler. And we all know that. And that's why governments, universities, foundations and corporations, like those represented by our speakers, have done all they can to make education affordable, accessible, and sometimes even free for those who most need them. But the story has changed. The world has changed. As change accelerates, we can no longer depend on a three to four year structured university degree. That is not enough because we'll be working for the next 50. We need now skills, and that's why skills have become the next new buzzword. Skills are very bite-sized education that we can, you know, reskill, upskill, and deliver as we are going to our 30s, our 40s, our 50s, and beyond. And if so, then what are the skills and educational subjects that we need to ensure that we unlock positive outcomes in health, climate, and peace. These three are, by the way, the main pillars of the Women's Forum this year. And how do we ensure that we foster equality and help to close the gender gap? Now, this is a very complex topic, and there are no easy answers. But fortunately, I have today with me three distinguished speakers to help me um, kind of unpack some of these topics. And I'll start with Professor Lily Kong. She's the president of Singapore Management University, and she's joining us all the way from Singapore. Good morning, Professor Kong. Good morning, Juliana, and to my fellow panelists, thank you very much for having me join virtually. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Tanya Sadezini, executive officer of CMA CGM Group and president of CMA CGM Foundation. Good morning, Tanya. Thank you for joining us. And of course, we have a gentleman, Mr. Jean-Dominique Senat, CEO of Renault Group. Thank you for being a male ally. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so I think I would like to start uh, by providing a little bit of context for today. So uh, maybe I'll ask uh, President Lily Kong, Professor Kong, to help us understand from the academic perspective, what do you think are the critical educational subjects and skills that we need to future-proof the youth for what is coming up next in the future? So thank you for that question, Juliana. I have dedicated my life to education. My late mother tells me that when I was three, I lined the dolls up against the wall and played teacher, and I've always wanted to be in education. So it's a great privilege to be in the role. I have spent a lot of time thinking about what our students need for now and for the future. And in 2018, 2017, 2018, I led at my university what was called a Blue Ribbon Commission for Undergraduate Education to rethink undergraduate education and to try and prepare them as best as we can for the future. And I would say that, you know, the days when education provided knowledge, content, um, are not entirely gone, but that is far less relevant today 
than during a time when I was a student, principally because technology has allowed easy access to content, knowledge, domain information that one can get online easily, um, whether through legitimate um, you know, sources or sometimes um, questionable sources that we would need to filter through. But that access to knowledge and information is so easy these days. So when we were thinking about graduate learning outcomes, the sorts of outcomes that we want out of education at my university, that was only one of five areas that we thought were important as a learning outcome. And even that has changed. That sense of needing to know a body of knowledge, whereas it used to be about understanding a particular domain in great depth, that disciplinary knowledge, that is still important. But increasingly, what is so much more important in this very complex and interconnected world that's very volatile and uncertain, to use that cliche, but very, very true nonetheless, is that students need to be able to make connections across different domains of knowledge. They need to be able to integrate perspectives from different points of view, different knowledges, different domains. And that integration is so important a skill that we mustn't leave to fate and chance. So one of the things that we think is really important in preparing students for the future is to have domains of knowledge, not necessarily a single domain, and then to be able to learn how to bring it together, to weave it together, to zoom in and to zoom out and to draw connections. But that, even all of that, is just one dimension of it. Juliana talks about skills. Um, and, you know, there is a conversation there about very practical skills. But what I'd like to focus attention on are the critical thinking skills the creative problem-solving skills that will stand our students in good stead whatever the world throws at them. If you're able to stare a problem in the face and say, well, this is how I'm going to go about beginning to think about unpacking it, about deconstructing the issues, and to then begin to think about possible solutions. So those second set of critical thinking, creative problem-solving skills are really important. But so too, a third area, a skill, if you will, are the interpersonal skills. You know, in this day and age where we're all wed to our mobile devices, we're not able to really communicate, persuade, cajole, make one's position clear. The number of times that I walk into a restaurant and I see couples, families, messaging away to one another perhaps, but to their friends and not communicating. That ability to connect with other people, to make your point and your view known, heard in persuasive ways, not necessarily in confrontational ways, those are real skills of learning to work with others. And that links to a fourth area that is absolutely critical, a sense of global citizenship that interpersonal skill that extends to intercultural skills. And the world is increasingly just going to need more and more understanding, not less of it. And the ability to navigate different cultures, to understand, to climb into someone else's shoes and walk around in them, that is what's going to make for a better world. And I would say, then finally, as a fifth area of a, of a graduate learning outcome, if you will, we decided that we wanted to pay attention to personal mastery, by which we mean the ability to pick yourself up when you fall, the resilience in the face of challenges, the you know, sort of conviction um, about certain causes and the ability to you know, uh, make a difference in whatever area you choose to be in through personal mastery through being able to manage yourself, through being able to pick yourself up when there's failure, and um, a certain self-directedness. Certainly in the context of Singapore, uh, sometimes it is said that, um, you know, students are 
led on a particular path. So you go from your O levels to your A levels to university and so forth. And the path is well trodden and well laid out. But what about that self-directedness to say, I am going to forge a different path. I'm willing to take that challenge and develop my own degree, um, which is what we're trying to do at SMU. We've offered a new program called Individualized Major, where you can begin to curate your own learning. And that is far more difficult than doing well in a well-established path. So domain knowledge, disciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, the integrative thinking that comes along with that, one. Critical thinking, creative thinking, problem solving skills, two. Interpersonal skills, three. Global citizenship, four. And personal mastery, five. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kong. Thank you so much, Professor Kong. And of course, there was an academic perspective. I now look on to Jean-Dominique to give us the corporate perspective, representing a very large company, of course. Well, thank you very much for, for having me here. Uh, I'm really uh, honored. Uh, and Professor Kong said so many important uh, things that it's difficult for me to add to what she said. So honestly, it, it's wonderful. But I will probably just give you a few hints of what I feel, and especially when it comes to women. Um, women have very specific skills. We have to just to recognize that. Um, I have always noticed that when the proportion of women increases in management teams, in plants, etc., in our industry, immediately the atmosphere changes, the, the, uh, the people less nervous, less, uh, I would say, aggressive, and it makes a tremendous change. But beyond that, I know very well by experience that women have a very specific skill of understanding the features of characters of different people. And that comes way above what men can do. I can tell you that, on average, of course. I have experienced that personally, and I think I benefited from that in the past. But I can tell you, um, when you are in front of a major decision, when it comes to people, by the way, when you have to promote somebody, when you have to think about, is that the right person for the right job? The opinion of women is, for me, much more important than the opinion of men, because they get it right very, very often for the very first time. No, I'm just telling you that. I'm not saying that because I'm sitting here in front of you, but it's reality. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just the point. Now, to the skills. If I can just, um, you know, um, point out a few major skills that, that women should and can encourage. Autonomy empowerment. That is for me uh, the key for the future, notably in corporates, uh, for management. Empowerment, that means that you are autonomous in the way you have to work and you have to be accountable also. That means that you have to be strong enough to take into account what you have done and to respond of your actions. Women should uh, promote that type of attitude in corporations. I mean, probably women are much better placed than others to accept that situation, which is a very difficult uh, situation to promote. So, empowerment, autonomy, skills for women, I think it, they are exactly up to the point. And maybe if I should add last point is, uh, and Professor Kong mentioned that uh, very simply, it's uh, courage. Courage is the key. Uh, in our world today, I mean, in our corporations, in the complexity of life and, and professional life, courage is something that is missing very often. Courage of management, you know. Um, let's face it, um, difficulties appear each time um, courage is out of the room. And I think women, generally speaking, and again, it's not by circumstances, have internally far more courage than men in many circumstances. Not all, but in many circumstances. Childbirth. And, and, you know, <laughs> and so if there is a skill that I'm encouraging you to promote and, and, and to foster is that one, courage. Because it always comes at a time where things are difficult, especially when it comes to people relationship. 
Well, um, I mean, I'm, when you talk about courage, Jean-Dominique, all I can think of is uh, childbirth. You have to be courageous to, you know, undergo childbirth. That's pretty scary, you know, in itself. <laughs> yes, but I mean, I think it's possible. I mean, yes. Well, well, we have a very interesting uh, suggestions from Professor Kong, autonomy from yourself. I would like to move on now to Tanya. You want know, to talk about CMACGM? So you run a very large organization, which I must note is family-owned remains, and then 150,000 employees around the world. You know, see. Uh, air, land, logistic solutions. And I also know that CMA CGM focuses a lot on education in particular. So why does the foundation support education around the world? And how are you doing so in particular with reference to girls? Oh yes, please. So Tanya is going to speak from the podium over here. Let's turn and look at her. At the Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. It's my very first time today at the Women's Forum, so I'm very proud and at the same time very impressed uh, by uh, this very nice audience. So thank you for the invitation. I would like to start by saying that women's empowerment is not only a matter of public policy, but you know that the business also, the business world is very involved and has a very major role to play. At CMA CGM, we are working in a shipping and logistics industry. You know, that is traditionally male dominated. And believe me, I know something about it. I think more than ever that we have to do something to improve the situation and also to lead our sector into a more sustainable and integrated development. At CME CGM, in our company, we are following our philosophy of life. Our story is a human and family story. Do you know my father, Jacques Saade, 45 years ago, founded the company after escaping the, Le after escaping the war in Lebanon with all the family. And to us, what is important is that a family business means that we have responsibility. We have responsibility for, of course, the environment, for peace, and you know also for what? For solidarity. And beyond our economic performance, we have the responsibility to be useful, to be useful for the society. So let me share with you what we are doing. Firstly, we are convinced that women play a very central role in all our societies. So it is women that we must reach foremost during crisis. And our foundation is specially committed to provide humanitarian aid and help to people in need. But what is the difference between other foundation? It is that our foundation is using our expertise, the logistics and the shipping expertise, such as vessels and containers. So let me tell you that we have transported more than 20,000 tons of humanitarian aid to countries like Yemen, India, during the COVID, we have transported on board our planes to India humanitarian aid and also oxygen. You remember India was lacking of oxygen. Lebanon. <laughs> Lebanon. In Lebanon, after the Beirut blast, we have mobilized all our team to send vessels, to send also containers of humanitarian aid. African continent and also Ukraine. Yes, Ukraine, that is very dear to our heart and that is in all our minds. We have, in partnership with the French government, last month, sent a vessel full of humanitarian aid directly to Constanza, then by land to Odessa. 
And you know, each time in these difficult moments, women have shown their leadership in their local communities. In fact, eight out of 10 leaders in local association, NGOs, and distribution system are women. And recently, I was visiting the warehouse of the Banque Alimentaire and the Resto du Coeur in Marseille. And believe me, I was struck by the strong presence of women, beneficiary women, and also all women distributing this humanitarian aid to all the people. We have also a second conviction, that progress depends on skills. And that starts, of course, with education. And, you know, history has proven that country with the highest rate of educated women, the overall economy was developing. That's why in our foundation, we make education as a priority. And also what is important that is in a family group like ours, acting for future generation is essential. So let me give you three examples that illustrate what, how education is so important for us. First, in Lebanon. Lebanon, that is a country very dear to me. And where access to electricity is a very huge issue today. Because Lebanon is going through a major economic and finance crisis. So what we have decided? We have to decided to help school in another way, an innovative way. Indeed, we have decided to transport solar panel and install them on roof of 10 schools. And now it is more than 100 children that can go to school without worrying about power cuts. And this is so important nowadays. My second example is in Côte d'Ivoire, near Abidjan. And we have partner with also somebody that is very famous over there. It's an African music group called Magic System. Yes, with a magic, with magic system. Why? Because they have a great foundation over there. And they told us that now what is important is to build school. And we had a very innovative idea. You know what? It's easy to build a school. You ask somebody to build it, and it's done. No. At CMA, we use our expertise. We have recycled our containers. And I'm very proud to tell you that today, we have built our first school in Port Bouy, near Abidjan. And we have already welcomed, a few weeks ago, 200 kids. Wow. Well done. Thank you. And of course, I make sure that we have also little girls going to school and going to these classrooms. So the first two examples were dealing with small kids. And my last example is more focused on young entrepreneurs. Indeed, in our home base of Marseille, we have decided to create a very innovative concept, an incubator, but a social incubator that helps young entrepreneurs develop projects with a social impact on education. And so far, we have supported more than 20 startups, that, and half of them are led and founded by women, and this is very important. And one of them that is a, a great startup, I don't know if you know it, it is Meet My Mama. And Meet My Mama is a very young lady. She has decided to create this startup with a high social impact. Why? Because she facilitates the reintegration of young women into society with their cooking talent. So it is another way. And believe me, it has a huge success today in France. So thank you, uh, Juliana. This is my thank you, first part on education. Thank, thank you, you, Tanya. Well done. Give her a round of applause.
please join us back at the, at, the, that, at the seats. So I think that has been wonderful. We've heard a lot about the good work done by CMA, CGM outside of your organisations. I would like to take our panellists back to within the organisations and actually do ask all of you, what have you been doing within your organisations to promote the, the upskilling, the reskilling of your workforce, in particular to support gender parity? Maybe we can begin with uh, Professor Lily Kong from Singapore. Very happy to speak to that. Um, so there are um, universities, you know, universities traditionally have been working with the traditional 18 to 24 year old students. And within that context, um, some of the things that I talked about earlier are very deliberate and intentional graduate learning outcomes. For them, if we're thinking about, you know, sort of gender parity, access, and so forth, what we've been very deliberate about doing is to ensure that we have scholarships available through philanthropic sources and so forth for students, particularly women. Um, there are ring-fenced scholarships, bursaries for students with financial need, women students with financial need, so that if they have the potential, they do not have to worry about access to education. And that's something we've worked really hard at and um, particularly not just students, women students from Singapore, but women students from the region. So we're very proud to say that we count amongst our Shireen Fosder scholars. These are scholarships dedicated to women students from low income families. We count among them those from India, from Indonesia, from Vietnam, from Malaysia, etc., around the region. And when they come to us, one of the things that's important is that we don't throw them in the pool of students and um, leave them to their own devices. And uh, we, we have set up a student success center to try and support them through their journey, and particularly if they're first generation college goers, this is really important. But Juliana, you asked about skills, and therefore I want to turn attention to a second group of students, if you will, and perhaps I should call them participants rather than students, because these tend to be the adult workers who you know, might have graduated five years ago, 10 years ago, the fact that knowledge and skills and expertise is now changing so rapidly. The half-life of knowledge has really shrunk compared to what it was before. So when I went to university, what I learned might have stood me in good stead for 10 years, 20 years, and I might have done that same job for that period of time. But new jobs are being created new kinds of careers, new skill sets are needed. So when one graduates, and I'm talking very much about graduates because I am, after all, from a university, but if you're a graduate at the age of 24, and you're gonna work till at least 64, if not 74, that's a good 40, 50 years. And whatever you might have learned needs to be refreshed, you need to upskill. And for some, it's not just upskill, you actually need to reskill entirely. So what, what can we do to support that? From a, a gender neutral perspective in the context of Singapore, I am very proud to say that the Singapore government has really invested in this. And so for every adult Singaporean, we are allocated a certain sum of money, 500 Singapore dollars that you can use to upskill in any area that you wish. Even my late mother, when she was 91, received her $500, and she was thrilled because she said, you know, I can go and learn something. So that commitment to continuing to upskill and reskill, gender neutral, is really important. Not only that, a lot of the programs for such upskilling and reskilling, which are developed and delivered by universities, we receive subsidies for our development costs. And that really reduces our costs. And for the individual who has government uh, subsidy to attend the courses, they also have to pay very little. Now, how does this speak to gender at all? There are issues in the implementation, and I'll be the first to recognize that there are challenges. If you're a woman juggling not just your work, but your family responsibilities, your care responsibilities, um, and, you know, as an aging population, we're also having to confront elder care challenges on top of child care challenges. This means that the extra burden on women 
has grown. And to find the time to go and avail yourself of these opportunities for upskilling and reskilling are at least doubly challenging. So organizationally, while we offer these courses for upskilling and reskilling, we offer it in a gender neutral way. What we do try and do is to find mechanisms to facilitate the participation by women. And some of it means doing it doing these um, upskilling courses in a blended way so that some of it is online and some of it is in person and the online version is asynchronous and you don't have to necessarily be synchronously available so that in her own time and space where she's able to carve out some time she's able to access this material this course um, in ways that would have not been possible if we insist that they come only in person. So there are strategies, tactics, techniques that we can use. But the most important thing is keeping in mind the fact that even while many policies are gender neutral, the impact is not gender neutral. And therefore, we need to put in place additional measures to make things accessible to women. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Lily Kong. The Skills Future credit she's referring to, about 300 euros a year, is indeed for everyone. And I think uh, you can learn all sorts of things. My own mom took a course on how to sell things on Facebook Marketplace, which for her allows her to actually earn money every day, selling things, bits and bobs from my home. Uh, Jean Dominique, maybe you can share with us. Yes. You know what do you do in Renault for? Yes. Well, I, I'm happy to share that because honestly, I, I, I think we are doing tremendous uh, progress uh, within the group today. Um, a few facts, first of all. I mean, let's face reality. Uh, when you just count people, uh, you end up saying there are only 25% of women in the Renault Group worldwide. 25% doesn't seem very high, does it? In the automotive industry it's one of the highest performance. Let's be proud about that. Uh, we're very far from where we should be, but 25% in the automotive industry is at the very top. By the way, now, I mean, that's the same in science. No, 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 yes. Science but the point important is that the 25% are not only for low responsibility people, if I may say so. They are also for top management. So we have 25% in the, in, the, in the sort of global board of management, 25% in the first 4,000 uh, executive and people, and 25% in the first 11,000 people. Now, this is not too bad, but we have a problem which starts with the roots in university and schools. You know that the automotive industry has not been very attractive in the past, but, 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 but I mean, generally speaking, when you look at uh, the population in, in engineering schools in our country, they are so small amount, I mean, we're talking about 18%, 20%. In, so the, the problem is that the roots here is in education from the very start. That's why we need help from the education system, from the state, etc., to promote women within the engineering schools. Now, afterwards, it comes to us. And when it comes to us, the good news is that I think that not only the automotive industry is starting to be much more attractive than it used to be, I mean, you have to visit our plants today, you will be surprised. I mean, it's just another world. I'm sure that you imagine that the automotive industry is, is a horrible world where people are sort of suffocating in plants and I don't know what, you know. But it's totally different. It's totally digital. It's totally software. I mean, you cannot imagine. I mean, women that I meet in the plants of Renault look so happy. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're not cheating with me. I mean, so honestly, <laughs> honestly, you should imagine what it is now. That's the good news. And the second news, which is, I think, the change of paradigm in this, uh, in this uh, business, is that we're running to a different world where uh, assembly of line of cars is becoming secondary. The rest is software, digital, data. I mean, it's a totally different object. And in this area, cybersecurity, you name it, everything, uh, artificial intelligence, I mean, all that is in the car today and in the center of, of what we are doing. Service is another, another amazing change. We are running through service pools 
and making sure that probably 20% or 30% of the turnover of this group will be only about service in mobility. Now, the new world of mobility, I'm telling you very sincerely, is changing massively. So we need to train people, and that's what we're doing. Not only do we train people in general, but we train women in particular. We have specific training programs, I won't go into the details, for middle management, for women per se, we make sure that they, the networks within the company are open to women and that they have their specific networks. You can be sure that at the very top of the company, starting with me, this subject about women training and women promoting is at the very first level of all our policies that we sort of not only acknowledge but promote at the level of the group, not only at the board but also in management. These training, specific trainings for women, are helping them to move up the scale of responsibilities and are helping us to live the new world of mobility. And I'm telling you, I mean, I've got so many examples of women within Renault that have seen the perspective through this training that I'm so proud to share that with you. It's happening as we speak. But we're starting from very low, we know. The, the targets of you know, I hate numbers because sometimes you're always talking about quotas and I, hope, I know that you hate that. But at some point, you, you need to go through that to make sure it happens. I'm sorry about that. Uh, um, last time I heard a, a woman tell me, I hope that you're not promoting me because I'm a woman. You know, the sort of thing that you hear is, is horrible. I mean, I, I hate that. I hope it will disappear soon. So the target of having 30%, 35% of women at the top level and then middle management and also in all sorts of level of the group is what we have for the next five to six, seven years. Seems too long perhaps to you, it's actually a tremendous performance. So training is at the center of all that. Thank you for that point. Thank you, John Dominique. Very happy to hear that you are personally sponsoring the progress of women in your organization. Also looking forward to, you know, electromobility as a future, you know, more electric cars, of course, hopefully. We have only time for one last question, and that's to, of course, Tanya. How are you within your organization supporting the progress of women? Please. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Dominique, also in shipping and logistics, it's not very glamorous, huh? so we have also <laughs> difficulties. But... For our 150,000 staff members all around the world, training and learning are really essential. Um, you know, to help evolving and to help imagining tomorrow sustainable shipping and logistics, we have decided to create an innovative center of training and innovation. And this center will be opening next year in Marseille and the or originality is that it will be welcoming the 150 staff members all around the world. So we have decided to create a new training facility. This is the first thing. Then, as I have said, shipping is traditionally male-dominated. And, of course, it is changing, but not enough. Let me give you two or three figures. The first one. Women are 43% of our workforce, but only 15% out of our top 200 are women. The objective is to double in 2025, and we're doing our best. But the only figure that is really low is sailors. You know that we have a lot of sailors also in our industry. We, they are only 4% of our sailors are women. This, of course, has to change. But how? Of course, we will do a lot of, and we're doing a lot of training for female sailors and try to communicate also, to break these gender stereotypes. But we have gone even further. And you know, we have 11,000 sailors in our group. And at the head of them, it is a woman. Her name is Christine. Excellent. She's there. 
she's with us. Give us a wave, please. And oh, she's yes, over there. You can she applaud her. her. Of course, she's a role model in our company. Yes. Thank you, Christine. Would you like for to stand up doing. And, and just stand up and say hi? And to together us. with Christine, we're doing our best, and we are proud to say that we have one, one vessel captain today, out of eleven thousand. Just one, but believe me, we are struggling to have. I hope a lot more next week, next year. Of course, like Renault, we are also working, you know, on two levels. Uh, collective levels, we have specific programs for women, um, leadership for women, but also we have very uh, individual programs and uh, f with mentoring and we support them, you know, uh, in their professional journey. And the difference is that I take care of it because it is a subject that is very, it is very dear to me and I Today, I'm at least following 50 women in our group, and I'm very happy to have some of them with also with me today, because I wanted them to share the experience of the Women's Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Well, we've run out of time, and I don't mean just our panel. I think we've run out of time to act. The time to act is now. If you have any suggestion for my speakers, I think they will be uh, available at lunchtime, so please come up and talk to Tanya and Jean-Dominique, of course, Lily's in Singapore. At this point, I would like to thank my speakers for joining us this morning. Thank you, Lily, all the way from Singapore. Thank you, Tanya and Jean-Dominique. I have time. something to say. Please. <laughs> I please have a special last, message. Last comments, yes. For all, you, of all of you in the audience, for all the women, if you are attracted by a family business, <laughs> driven by passion, with very strong values, and this resonates for you, please, there is certainly a place for you in our company. So do not hesitate to come yes. and see me at the lunch well break. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Juliana, and to our wonderful panel. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lily, all the way from Hong Kong. Thank you so much, Don Dominique. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Juliana. That was wonderful. Thank you so much.